At the dawn of a new millennium, Australia was on top of the world, with the Sydney Olympic Games being declared the best summer games ever. It was a time of renewed optimism for the future, including Australian car manufacturing. Holden leading the charge with unprecedented product diversity under a dynamic and passionate boss, Peter Hannenberger. Buoyed by the success of the VT, the most successful Commodore with sales of more than 300,000, Holden had launched the new WH Statesman and Caprice in 1999, followed in 2000 by the VT's upgraded VX successor and the General's first all-new ute in a decade. The VU was the first Holden ute fitted with smoother riding, independent rear suspension, an acknowledgement that Australia's traditional sedan-based utes had evolved into more of a sporting lifestyle role, as tradies made a wholesale shift to imported high-riding one-tonners for work duties. The Middle East and South America were also emerging as Holden's major export markets, with left-hand drive Commodores and Statesmans rebadged as Chevys. They were very, very good days though. There's, no, there's nothing like uh, grabbing your attention by keeping busy. We were also doing left-hand drive, which we found a market for in the Middle East because our friends in America decided to stop making the Chevy Impala, which was a mainstay of their market from a passenger car point of view in Europe. And we went over there and showed them in 1995, we showed them VT and WH and said, we'll have these cars in 97 and 99 and they'll be available in left-hand drive. Are you interested? Well, of course they were because the mainstay of their passenger car volume was about to disappear. Ford Australia was also fighting back from its AU Falcon woes under inspirational new boss Jeff Pilates, with an emphasis on high performance. He established a new special vehicles dealer network called Ford Tickford Experience, convinced Holden Racing hero Craig Lowndes to join the blue team, and in anticipation of a reborn Monaro, imported hundreds of V8 Mustangs from the US, which Tickford converted to right-hand drive. Jeff Pilates really got the place firing. It was just incredible. You see in all corporations, it just takes the change of a leader. He was so frustrated by the huge amount of support that Holden had in racing and through Holden Special Vehicles. As promised, Holden's captivating two-door Commodore show car did become a production reality in 2001 creating a buying frenzy. Holden also gave in to overwhelming nostalgic demand to call it Monaro, with some fun 1960s marketing themes, including a return to Mount Panorama with a wild 7-litre V8 version, which dominated the short-lived Bathurst 24-hour race. Holden Special Vehicles launched their own high-output variants, the GTO and top-shelf GDS Coupe. Yeah, I mean, the temptation when you do something like Monaro and the, the original show car was, let's use as many VT bits as we can to get this thing up and running, and we did. But then when you go up and say, well, well hang on, we're gonna go and put it into production now. Oh, why don't we do some new wheels? No. Why don't, what about a new dash panel? No. One of the ironclad rules was, we are going to produce the show car that we presented in Sydney in 1998. 2002 was also a big year for Ford Australia, with the launch of the award-winning BA Falcon range. a 500 million upgrade of the unloved AU, which included handsome styling, 
rework suspension and multi-valve engines comprising dual overhead cam turbocharged sixes and V8s. Ford boss Pilates was clearly determined to challenge Holden and HSV in the performance high ground. UK tuning firm ProDrive replaced Tickford with a new special vehicles arm called Ford Performance Vehicles or FPV. As a result, the design and production of all XR6 and XR8 Falcons was brought in-house at Ford, leaving FPV to concentrate on premium Turbo 6 and V8 models, including the return of the legendary GT to the lineup. When Jeff Pilates was the president of the company, they supported a lot of teams. He was very proactive. He was an Aussie, running an Aussie Ford company. Most of the presidents that were, in my time anyway, were American. They didn't quite understand our culture and our racing culture, so, so he was very good for it. And he was actually, you know, a, a big supporter of what became FPV, which was the performance road cars, which I was involved with. ProDrive also replaced Tickford on the track with a new factory-backed V8 supercar team called Ford Performance Racing. And with the Aussie dollar worth half of a US dollar, the time was ripe for exports. With Holden creating a new $300 million V6 engine plant in Port Melbourne to do just that, export. From his appointment as Holden's new boss in 1999, Peter Hannenberger drove his team hard to develop new market niches and increase exports. During what could be described as a renaissance for Holden, he expanded the VY Commodore range to seven different body shapes, all in the hope of challenging increasingly successful imported light commercial and sports utility vehicles. <clears throat> Remember the adventurer? The Adventurer, a high-riding all-wheel drive Commodore wagon, arrived in 2003. It was quickly followed by the Crewman with cross-track all-wheel drive and then came the return of the Holden One Tonner. HSV created the Avalanche wagon, but none of these machines fired the public imagination. It hadn't been since you know, HQ 1972 would be the last time when you could think of chassis cabs, utilities, panel vans, and short wheelbases and long wheelbases and, and coupes and four-door sedans. All of that went away be simply because the money wasn't there to do it. But then we had had a lot of success in the latter years of the VN, VP, VR, VS Commodore. We had made a considerable amount of money in comparison to where we'd been. The objective was to try and keep the volume going and with Peter at the helm, we weren't short of ideas on that. Mitsubishi Motors Australia Limited, which had taken over from Chrysler Australia back in 1981, was in trouble. A facelift on the Magda by Mitsubishi's new chief designer, Olivia Boulay, resulted in an aggressive new grill on the old body, which made for an unhappy mishmash. So the Magna overall has very, very nice proportions. It's quite sporty and elegant. It's not too big, it's not too small. It's exactly what you need. Head office approved the plans for a Magna successor and the Tonsley Park plant was given a major workover. This was a last roll of the dice to keep Mitsubishi building cars in Australia. You come in on a Monday morning at 7.30 and the place is just abuzz with activity and people using their skills in the best way. Compared to other manufacturers in Australia, I mean, I think we build the best quality vehicle in Australia. You need passionate people with a great pride in what they do. It's uh, part of my life and part of my soul, I suppose. Well, we can now offer Australia's best new car warranty. If you can find a better built, better back car anywhere, then buy it. These rear wheel drives are raced on tracks in predictable conditions. But what if the track was unpredictable and they were tested against the Magna? Well, they'd probably go as far as the first corner. The awesome Magna with Quadtech all-wheel drive makes every drive a gripping drive. Marcus Ambrose and his BA Falcon restored Ford's pride on the track by winning V8 supercar titles back-to-back. -back. Whilst Jeff Pilates' plan to enter the fast-growing sports utility vehicle market would prove to be better conceived than Holden's. Benchmarked against the BMW X5, Ford Australia launched its new Falcon-based territory SUV in 2004 to media acclaim. It soon shot to number one in the SUV market. Oh yeah, Ford wanted their slice of this pie too.
but success was relatively short-lived, while the market cried out for diesel SUVs. Ford devoted scarce engineering resources to develop a high-performance petrol turbo variant first. Dealers were losing buyers to imported rivals until a diesel territory arrived in 2011. By then, the territory was getting a little bit long in the tooth. To develop an SUV off the Falcon platform, very, very smart in terms of parts commonality, but it wasn't you know, in any way a shortcut measure. It was an absolutely brilliant vehicle you know, in terms of its accommodation, the amount of stuff you could carry inside it, its performance. You know, the Territory should always stand there as an, as an icon of the Jeff Pilates era and one of the most outstanding vehicles, I think, produced by the Australian car industry. In 2004, Holden launched its VZ Commodore range with a new technically advanced 3.6-litre Alloy Tech V6, built in Melbourne and slated for export to Alfa Romeo, Saab and others. Holden was building a world-class engine good enough for the Europeans. Yep, selling Aussie engines to the Europeans. Go Australia! Holden's boldly facelifted Monaro went to America as a left-hand drive Pontiac GTO. This was Holden's first export program to the US. While the Monaro was hailed locally as a beautifully styled car, it was considered underdone for American tastes and never really caught on. Underdone? What are they talking about? HSV released its performance $100,000 all-wheel drive Coupe 4, but the customer base responded lukewarmly and few were tempted out of Japanese or European premium sports offerings. Toyota produced its two millionth Australian car, buoyed by a strong export market in the Middle East, but locally, few noticed. In 2005, Mitsubishi launched its last gasp, the 380 sedan. But with poor marketing and oddball styling, it was too little, far too late. We've created the ultimate Australian car. Now it's up to you to create the ultimate Australian road to match it. Mitsubishi 380, love the road. Management at Mitsubishi were given three different designs to look at and make the decision from. They chose that one, which then went into production as 380. As a car, it was pretty good. The US Pontiac GDO program finished after disappointing sales. Then Ford Australia gave its BA Falcon a minor upgrade to create the BF. The 10 millionth Camry worldwide was built in Altona and the uh, unpopular Avalon was discontinued. Not too many people turned up to that goodbye party, I bet. <clears throat> they called it Holden's billion dollar baby. The launch of the all new V Commodore and the luxury Statesman and Caprice in 2006 was another reminder that Australia was still one of the few countries in the world with the ability to design and develop a world class car from scratch. It's the dawn of a new age in driving. Introducing the all-new Holden Commodore. Designed from the word go to be one of the most exciting cars in the world. With electronic stability program standard for added safety and with linear control suspension, it leaves the competition in the Stone Age. The all-new Holden Commodore. So this was a long-term project for Holden that was designed to assure its future. And I guess it did. If you look at sales, you know, the EH Holden was top seller, then the HQ eclipsed that. Well, the VE actually became the number one selling Holden of all time. So nobody can say that it wasn't successful, but it did open up markets in the US. However, the VE raised questions over Holden's judgment in investing so heavily in a new full-size family sedan. At a time when Australian car buyers were diversifying into smaller sedans, dual cab 4x4 utes and SUVs. Holden hoped the VE would rekindle Australia's affection for the locally made Commodore and, with its left-hand drive capability, provide export opportunities into the US and Middle East. VT was, from a styling iteration, very similar to the Omega, which was in Germany, but VE was similar to nothing. 
VE was its own car. And that, that is the very first time, I think, in the history of the 1948 to 2006 that it was a standalone car. In the same year, Toyota Australia also reached an important milestone, having exported half a million Aussie-made Toyotas since its first Corona exports started in the late 1970s. Production of the Avalon's replacement, the new six-cylinder Orium, also commenced alongside Camry at the Altona plant, with both cars sharing many components to maximise production efficiency. Toyota, just down the road in Altona, was exporting probably 50-55% of its Camry production going overseas. So there's a huge amount of money coming in, which is why that company was profitable where the other two were not. And it was all down to, well, the management, if you like. They, they told Toyota Australia to go and seek markets wherever you can find them. The, the Ford and Holden people weren't, weren't allowed to, um, which is intriguing because the Americans actually tested the Australian Ford Territory. They bought a base model and a gear, took them over to Dearborn, ran them around their proving ground over in America, then sent a report back to the Australians that said, this is the best car we make. They actually tried to put a case to have the Territory built in America, not invented here. So it never happened. Holden launched its new VE utility in 2007, with more nostalgia-themed icon marketing that tried to pluck Aussie heartstrings in the face of declining sales. Only five years before, Holden held almost 22% of the market. By 2007, it was down to 14%. Ford Australia continued to struggle, having lost a large proportion of its customer base during the AU period and then hanging on too long to the styling themes of the BA models. As a result, Ford held only 10% when it launched the FG Falcon range in 2008. Another factor was Ford never developed a meaningful export market for the Falcon, meaning all its eggs were hatching in Australian and New Zealand baskets. Ford still struggled. In fact, I don't think Ford even outsold Holden since that time, even with the BABF models, Holden was still number one because Holden stuck to its, its, uh, you know, its strategy of delivering the right car to the market and they didn't have that misstep. And a lot of those Ford loyalists that they lost in uh, AU days didn't go back to Ford. To rekindle a love affair for the family wagon, Holden launched the stylish Commodore sports wagon. Despite a strengthening Aussie dollar, Holden remained bullish on niche exports to the US to boost local production volumes. Pleasing thing with the wagon was, first of all, it didn't look like Dad's family wagon. It looked like a sharp, you know, sporty car that people were not going to sit down and cringe and say, look, don't look at me, I'm, I know I'm driving a wagon, but I have to. So I, I was very pleased with that. The VE in left-hand drive SS form was reborn stateside as the Pontiac G8 GT. This soon expanded to a premium GXP version and a planned sports truck based on the VE SS Ute. In stark contrast, Mitsubishi announced that due to poor sales of its 380, its Australian car manufacturing arm was no longer viable. It shut down its Adelaide plant at Tonsley Park, which had been building cars since the early 1960s, to become a full-time importer. Ripples were felt amongst the Australian supply industry, which had become reliant on three main players. Another one bites the dust. Mitsubishi Motors will pursue a full import strategy, business strategy in Australia and will no longer manufacture our large passenger car, the 380 sedan, which will in fact be discontinued. The global financial crisis triggered by the collapse of subprime mortgage investments in the US sent financial markets into freefall. The GFC claimed numerous scalps, including General Motors, which filed for bankruptcy in 2009. Under a Chapter 11 restructure, the General had to become leaner and meaner by killing off several of its brands. These included Hummer, Saturn and Pontiac. With the demise of Pontiac, Holden's promising export program also died. The slumming of sales of the Commodore and Statesman in the Middle East were also causing Holden pain. 
Despite the free trade overtones, Australian manufacturers didn't receive the much needed boost for Aussie exports, a problem not helped by the ever strengthening Aussie dollar. By 2009, making cars in Australia was more than a fight for market share. It was becoming a fight for survival. The Australian automotive landscape was changing. User choose of fleet purchasing and a reduction in government sales was having a big impact on local offerings. I mean, can you imagine government not supporting local jobs and Aussie made? Hard to believe. The move to SUVs and crew cabs, as well as the fact premium European makes were moving their offerings downstream into lower price ranges. It had a big effect. Brands like Benz, Audi, BMW with small and medium-sized vehicles meant a taste of luxury like never before. Keeping up with the Joneses often started to include having a fancy European car in the driveway. So local offerings started to appeal more to enthusiasts than to the mainstream. There were a lot of cars that were affordable, European and had that kind of wow factor that the Australian cars were missing. The Audis, the BMWs, the Mercedes, for the first time people could actually afford these sorts of cars. 2007 saw the end of the Fairlane and LTD, once the mainstay of corporate and government sales. This was followed by the death of the Falcon Wagon. Can you believe it? Fairlane, LTD, used to drive around our Prime Ministers, and the Aussie family Falcon Wagon, all gone. Once Ford started dropping, you know, the Fairlane and LTD from the range, and then it dropped the wagon from the range, then all of a sudden the Falcon volume really didn't stack up, and also the lack of an export market. You know, Holden at least had some reasonable volume in left-hand drive, Ford didn't have that. And so that was really the, bit, the beginning of the end for Ford in Australia. But Ford wasn't giving up. The FG Falcon Mark II became the first Australian-made car with the maximum five-star ANCAP safety rating. Ford Performance Vehicles launched the powerful 335-kilowatt supercharged V8 GT and the turbocharged F6, but these were only small-volume niche vehicles. There was a sense it was already too late for FPV and probably too late for Ford Australia. Even Ford's excellent liquid-injected LPG FG Falcon, which could deliver four-cylinder running costs in a large car, failed to excite buyers. Part of the problem was Ford's marketing. Gone with the aggressive and compelling campaigns from the 1960s to the 1980s. Some of these cars were well-kept secrets as far as the Australian public was concerned. The greatest Australian road car had gone missing in action. Holden tried to tap into the US police car market with the Holden-built Chevrolet patrol car, a left-hand drive rebadged Holden Caprice, another testimony to Holden's engineering expertise. But sales were always going to be relatively low with pressure on local agencies to buy American. Imagine that, buy local, eh? If you look at actually subsidise or subsidies for uh, foreign manufacturers you know even the countries like germany you know great brands fantastic brands that have global appeal the amount of subsidy for uh, manufacturers there and in other countries is is quite high compared to what australian manufacturers were receiving so you know when we talk about a free economy it's just it just simply is not a level playing field some critics argued Holden should be making small cars. In 2011, Holden commenced manufacture of the Cruze alongside the VE Commodore in Elizabeth. But slow sales and the love affair for low-priced European cars and Korean price leaders made for a very competitive market. In response to some government departments saying that they would not buy six-cylinder cars, Ford Australia released its EcoBoost four-cylinder turbocharged Falcon. The EcoBoost is an all-new technology. It really epitomises the direction of, of Ford for downsizing and boosting of engines. It really is a great engine for its performance and delivery and really will surprise people in, in a large car. In days gone by, Ford marketers would have made a compelling case to customers to enjoy the space of a big car with the running costs of a four, just like in the 1980s. When Ford Australia came out with a truly brilliant car, a truly brilliant car, people were thinking, a four-cylinder Falcon? 
How can a four-cylinder Falcon? They'd done too much of a good job over the years of convincing people they needed a six-cylinder engine, that a four-cylinder car was anemic. That when they brought out their own four-cylinder car, they'd already converted the public. The public wasn't interested. But the campaign was nowhere to be seen. The government departments weren't buying the cars in anywhere near enough volume. In fact, the government policy of buying local was all but disappearing. Ford Australia sold more four-cylinder Falcons to itself than to anyone else. 600 of them. Australian manufacturers had always relied on strong government sales, federal, state and local. While the profit margins were low, this volume kept the assembly plants rolling, and once these cars were on-sold, provided Australian families with great value on the second-hand market. So you had councils and government departments buying fully imported vehicles when actually equivalent locally made products were available. This doesn't make sense. It doesn't matter where you go around the world, in the United States, Japan, Europe. The governments buy locally made product. That, that's just a fact. And that provides a really important basis for manufacturers to just cover their basic costs. Another outstanding local that deserved more was the Camry Hybrid. The first edition arrived in February 2010, and its successor followed two years later. The Australian car industry was trying very hard, but the odds were increasingly stacked against it. Today is a, is a great day for uh, the environment, uh, for the economy, great day for jobs, great day for Toyota, and a great day for our state. And I'm delighted to be here at the beginning of what is an exciting new era. It's a cleaner, greener era for our automotive industry here in Victoria. The reason our government pursued the hybrid with such enthusiasm is that we saw this project as absolutely vital, absolutely essential to our state. I thought at the time those cars were new, the Camry Hybrid and particularly the EcoBoost Falcon were among the best family cars you could buy in Australia probably the best. Neither of them sold well. Too late. Australia was negotiating free trade agreements with numerous countries, including Japan, Thailand, China and South Korea. Sales of Aussie-made cars dropped to 220,000 in 2012, from a peak of 475,000 in 1970. The agreement with Thailand brought almost 2 million Thai-built cars into the country between 2005 and 2017, displacing South Korea as our second biggest source of imported vehicles behind Japan. Despite the free trade agreements, these countries often put other taxes in place based on engine capacity, for example, making Australian car exports virtually impossible. As to why Ford didn't really export aggressively, it tried to sell some territories into, you know, some of the Asian countries, but then, you know, they had uh, tariffs on vehicles with larger, you know, engines at four litre capacity had something like a 100% tariff. So even though we had these free trade or so-called free trade agreements, it just didn't, it just didn't go both ways. By March 2013, Australians brought more Hyundais than Holdens. The much improved VF Commodore arrived in June, then HSV introduced its brilliant supercharged F-Series GTS. In September, the Liberal Party was elected. I can inform you that the Government of Australia has changed for just the seventh time promising to reduce subsidies, payments of which were upwards of $4 billion since 2000. Despite subsidies in other countries like Germany, England and the USA being higher, an already embattled Australian car industry with low, often zero tariffs was increasingly on its own. The companies that had been attracted to Australia to produce cars locally under previous government policy were on the outer. Good evening. First tonight, the end of the line. Victoria's manufacturing industry in crisis, with Ford pulling the plug on its local operations. In October 2013, Ford announced that local manufacture would end in 2016. Although it would continue to operate its proving ground and be a key centre for Ford Global Design for vehicles that were built overseas. Ford has been part of our Australian way of life forever even before rolling out the Model T in Geelong, Victoria, back in 1925. In January 2014, amid mounting speculation, 
Holden announced it too would cease local manufacture in 2017. A decision made in the US. This is GMH, the home of the FJ, the Kingswood, Tirana, Commodore and the Monaro, raced by Brock, Harvey, Bond and the list goes on. Yet company executives blame the strong currency and excessive competition in a small local market. So in February, Toyota Australia, the first subsidiary outside Japan to ever manufacture a Toyota, announced that it too would cease local production in 2017. The reality was, it was like dominoes. One manufacturer fell down, they all fell down. In late 2014, Australia launched its final FG X Falcon. But by July 2016, the company had commenced its phase shutdown, starting with the last Falcon Ute at Broadmeadows, followed in September by the last engine from its Geelong plant, the birthplace of Ford Australia. In October came the last territory and the last Falcon. Fittingly, the Falcon nameplate was retired out of respect. More than 3.8 million Falcons were manufactured in 56 years. In total, Ford Australia produced almost 6 million vehicles in 91 years. A huge contribution to the economy and the Australian way of life. Then it was the production of Holden's Cruise that ended in October, followed by Holden's engine plant at Fisherman's Bend, the birthplace of Holden. Since 1948, Holden had built more than 10 million engines, with exports of its world-class four-cylinder and V6 engines generating millions in export earnings. In early October 2017, the last Toyota Camry left the Altona line after more than half a century of local manufacture and over 3.5 million Aussie-built Toyotas, many of which were exported. And the last to close was Holden, when the final Commodore rolled off the Elizabeth Line in Adelaide on October the 20th, 2017, the company had produced almost 7.7 .7 million vehicles in 68 years. An amazing achievement.
So, why did Aussie car manufacturing fail? Well, you could start with the Aussie dollar, which stubbornly soared beyond parity with the US dollar, crippling exports and favouring imports. But I also reckon every Australian must also wear some of the blame, because for whatever reason, we just stopped buying Aussie-made cars. Why? I don't know, was it the cultural cringe and our ever-increasing desire to keep up with the Joneses next door and their fancy imported car in the driveway? The end of more than 90 years of Australian automotive mass production was also the start of a big loss in our manufacturing capability and self-sufficiency that would ultimately claim up to 50,000 jobs, both directly on the production line and indirectly through hundreds of suppliers, large and small. And you know, with those jobs went generations of passion, commitment, homegrown ingenuity, improvisation and innovation, unique and irreplaceable skill sets, which for almost a century made Australia one of only a handful of countries in the world that could design and build its own cars. And if you can build cars, you can build anything. Washing machines, sewing machines, TVs, military vehicles, tools and machinery. With engineering and design facilities still in Australia, we continue to make huge contributions on the world automotive stage. Our skills and expertise are recognised around the globe. The Australian car industry gave us a legacy of which we can all be incredibly proud. Motoring enthusiasts across Australia, keep our local flame alive. Collect and preserve our history. Celebrate all that was great and unique in this island nation of Aussie know-how and can do. In good times and bad and everything in between, the motoring industry really has supported us. Gave us jobs, taught us skills, a new start for many coming to our shores. But our cars also entertained us. They took us to work, to the beach on holidays, to drive-ins and to church on Sundays, for some of us. And they created legends from our racetracks, pushing man and machine to the limit and beyond, in front of race fans who became customers. They kept so many of us employed, manufacturing components or working on assembly lines, to designing and engineering, to marketing and selling to customers through dealerships that are dotted throughout our communities in this great country of ours, putting food on the table for so many Australian families, giving hope and opportunity for our children and the next generation. It's true, our locally made cars were so much more than just transport. Make no bones about it, we've all lost something here. It really is the end of an era. T-Model Ford where it all began. FJ Holden. Classic. GDHO. Legend. E76 Leyland. Wheels car of the year. Laser the Amazer. XK Falcon. First of the Aussie Falcons. Hey, Charger. VK Blue Manny. What a weapon. Even as a Holden fan, gotta say, XB Coupe. Love that car.
I'm Shane Jacobson. I'll see you on the road.